believe there's a better operator or restaurateur than me. Read take it! And if Gordon can't get through to this control... Today, we're diving into the world of kitchen nightmares to check out some of the most successful turnarounds Chef Ramsay pulled off. These restaurants went from struggling to thriving, and their stories are pretty amazing. Now let's dive into our first success story that will leave you inspired. I'm not gonna let anybody get in my way, including Chef Ramsay. Your ego is huge. People don't like you. In this episode of Kitchen Nightmares, Chef Ramsay headed to Cafe Han in Baltimore, Maryland, a restaurant started by Denise Whiting in 1992. The cafe stood out with its giant flamingo on the front and colorful exterior. Denise had named the place Han, a term locals used as a way of showing friendliness. Hugs you when you get here. It's However, in 2010, Denise made the controversial decision to trademark not just the cafe's name, but also the word Han itself. To make money. She wanted to sell her mugs, her t-shirts, her little knick-knack things. And this didn't sit well with the community, who felt like she had taken something important from them. At first, the people of Baltimore supported Denise, but trademarking Hun for her own use and to sell merchandise backfired, causing a boycott. Denise had Baltimore behind her, and then she announced that she trademarked Hun, and that ticked off a big portion of Baltimore. Business took a nosedive, and Denise began taking her frustrations out on her staff. Oh, come on, really? What is this supposed to be? Before visiting the restaurant, Chef Ramsay dropped by a local radio station to get some insight into why the community had turned its back on Cafe Honorable. Now, he quickly learned that Han was more than just a word. It was a cultural staple in Baltimore. The community had been using the word long before Cafe Han existed. So when Denise trademarked it, people felt like she had taken something that belonged to them. She went to a newspaper and said, I own it. I own the word. She even went as far as to threaten legal action against anyone who used the word without her permission. The main issue wasn't the name of the cafe, but the fact that she had claimed ownership over something that represented the heart of the city. When Chef Ramsay finally arrived at Cafe Han, he was welcomed by Debbie, the manager, who had been there for 13 years. She called in Denise, and the two sat down for a private talk. Not long into their conversation, Denise broke down, revealing that business had dropped by 50%. She had poured everything she had into the cafe and didn't know what to do to fix it. She admitted that the trademark situation had hurt her business, but still blamed the local media for blowing it out of proportion. Your life? Yeah. What, death threats? Well, people wishing me dead. Chef Ramsay ordered some of the restaurant's most popular dishes. The Big Bay Club, English-style fish and chips, and the much better than mom's meatloaf. As in better than mom's at home. Better than your own mom. Oh, wow, okay, great. The food was disappointing. The club sandwich was massive, and while the crab was tasty, the shrimp was stone cold and seemed old. I eat a sandwich this wide, but I mean, honestly, it's a question of death. Do you mind? God, they're ghastly. Taste of the fridge. The head chef, Greg, confided that most of the recipes were Denise's and that they weren't great. Denise, on the other hand, believed her food was perfect and couldn't imagine Chef Ramsay having a problem with it. The fish and chips were greasy, dry, and soggy, while the meatloaf had no flavor and was served with cold sides and gravy that drowned the dish. Denise seemed shocked that Chef Ramsay didn't like any of her food, making her question whether he was the right person to help. Never think she's wrong. This is perfect. And that's her biggest downfall. During the dinner service, the kitchen was overwhelmed for the first time in a year, thanks to the buzz of Chef Ramsay's presence. Denise, however, slowed things down by barking orders and micromanaging small tasks like preparing asparagus. As a result, dish after dish got sent back to the kitchen. Denise kept pulling items off the menu, leaving them with barely anything to serve. Amanda, one of the servers, mentioned that instead of solving problems, Denise tended to stop serving certain dishes altogether. By the end of the night, $800 worth of food had been thrown away, and Denise couldn't understand what went wrong, still convinced that it was the menu that needed changing. He has got to get through her thick skull. If she doesn't take his advice, we're not going to make it. The next morning, Chef Ramsay held a staff meeting without Denise to get their honest opinions about her. The staff didn't like how she spoke to them, her negativity, or her controlling behavior. Debbie, the manager, pointed out that things ran more smoothly when Denise wasn't around. The staff feared speaking up because they were afraid of getting fired. When Denise showed up to the meeting, Chef Ramsay encouraged the staff to share their thoughts. They expressed their frustrations, and Denise was hit hard when one employee said nobody liked her. 
she broke down, apologizing to her team and promising to change. It was an emotional moment for everyone. You're a rude bitch. And I'm tired of it. I'm sorry that I've been a bit overbearing. I'm gonna step back and let. And Jeff Ramsey then arranged a meeting with local residents while Denise listened through headphones. The locals were still upset about the trademark and thought Denise was only after money. One resident even shared that he had received a cease and desist letter for using Han in a website name. The state government had to ask for her approval to use the word Han in their ad campaign. The locals made it clear that they might come back to Cafe Han if she gave up the trademark. Hearing the community's feedback was a wake-up call for Denise. She finally admitted her mistake and agreed to take responsibility. All the things that were happening and didn't know how to handle them and I was in denial, I get it now. After revamping the restaurant and menu, the staff were thrilled with the changes. Chef Ramsey then took Denise to a local radio station where she publicly apologized for trademarking Hun and announced that she was giving up the rights to the word. Look at this beauty! Oh, oh my <laughs> <laughs> Gone are those hideous colors. Now we have a consistent, bright vibrance. The relaunch was a success, with locals packing the cafe and enjoying the new decor and food. Yelp reviews following the episode were mixed. Some diners were still unhappy with the service and food, while others brought up the trademark controversy. However, over time, the restaurant's fortunes turned around. Cafe Han not only regained the community's trust, but also became a local favorite once more. The food quality had improved significantly, with Chef Ramsay praising the revamped dishes, including their standout burgers. Denise became recognized for her contributions to the community, and the restaurant's reputation soared. By 2015, Cafe Han had transformed into a thriving business and even expanded its operations, attracting tourists and loyal locals alike. When Chef Ramsay revisited Cafe Han in 2012, he found that some locals had started to forgive Denise, especially after she gave up the trademark. The food had improved, with Chef Ramsay praising the burgers, and Denise was recognized for her contributions to the community. While some people were still hesitant to fully embrace Cafe Han again, Many had come to appreciate Denise's changes and efforts to repair her relationship with the community. The restaurant continued to operate successfully until Denise eventually decided to move on in 2022, possibly into retirement, leaving behind a legacy of perseverance and redemption. The space was taken over by the Foreman Wolf Restaurant Group. This episode originally aired on February 24, 2012, and was filmed in November 2011 as part of Kitchen Nightmares Season 5, Episode 13. Next up, this place went from failing to thriving in record time. So it's a big ticket. Oh, boy. Don't have a prime No one looked in there? Seriously? In this Kitchen Nightmares episode, Chef Ramsey Ramsey visited Spin a Yarn Steakhouse in Fremont, California. The restaurant was owned by Saki, a Greek immigrant who had bought the place in 1995. Jennifer, his wife, initially went to the restaurant looking for a waitress job, and after a couple of years, they got married. No one looked in there? Seriously? When business started to decline, Jennifer suggested a remodel, which ended up costing a whopping $950,000, way over their original $300,000 budget. She didn't bother checking prices and simply picked things she liked, which caused them to spend more than $600,000 extra. The kicker? I was just told to go pick out what you like, and now I'm realizing I have expensive tastes. All those expensive changes were made on a leased property, so they didn't even own the building. Even after the remodel, the restaurant continued to struggle, and their marriage became strained, with constant fighting. We wound up spending almost $950,000. And after I remodeled this place, everything just went down. <laughs> Chef Ramsay met with Jennifer at her home, where she explained how they met and admitted that she had gone overboard with the remodel. She acknowledged her mistake, but the stress had taken a toll on their relationship. I'm fired. Did you pay the insurance? Yeah, it's been hard on my relationship. What did you this one stuff for? It just really stresses him out because he wants to work more because he's trying to pull us out of this hole. At the restaurant, Chef Ramsay was greeted by Erica, the hostess, and the waiters, who were dressed in tuxedos and bow ties. The formal attire gave off a funeral vibe, so Chef Ramsay joked around, having them pretend to carry a coffin. Holy crap! You look more like funeral undertakers than you do waiters. Then, Saki took Chef Ramsay on a tour of the restaurant, showing off all the renovations. $80,000 had been spent on the bathroom alone, and the place was decked out with marble countertops and $50 tiles. 
Chef Ramsay learned that Spin a Yarn was trying to be a steakhouse, seafood place, and a spot for pasta and continental cuisine all at the same time. Stunning tiles, you put the butterflies on there. Yes, my wife's favorite, favorite. When it was time to eat, Chef Ramsay tried a Greek sampler, crab louis, and a filet mignon. Unfortunately, the food was terrible. The Greek sampler tasted like canned food. The crab louis smelled off. And yes, the crab meat was canned. And the filet mignon was rubbery and tasted like cough syrup. Now, chef Ramsay went to the kitchen to give feedback and learned that the head chef, Victor, was just following the recipes Saki had given him. Even Victor thought the food was outdated. Disgusting. Crab Louie wasn't invented in the city. So that was the original recipe we have from, from here. That's the old recipe. When dinner service started, things quickly spiraled out of control. The kitchen was severely understaffed. Victor was even stuck washing dishes. Orders came back with complaints, and the food waste piled up. Saki stood by, not doing much to help. Yeah, I guess not. He's your head chef. Then, Chef Ramsay discovered raw and cooked meat stored together in the walk-in fridge, along with moldy produce and rotting chicken. The stench was so bad that Jennifer threw up in the bathroom. Chef Ramsay showed them how bad things were, and the whole staff, including Jennifer and Saki, pitched in to clean up the mess. Raw meat, cooked meat. Oh dear. When were they cooked? Congealed blood here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All in there. Huh? Just all sand then. The next day, Chef Ramsay sat down with Jennifer and Saki to address their communication issues. Jennifer said she felt powerless in the business, but Saki promised to give her more support. Chef Ramsay gave them new roles for dinner service. Saki would expedite in the kitchen, and Jennifer would carve prime rib tableside. She was nervous and fumbled at first, but after a pep talk from Chef Ramsay, she got the hang of it and started to enjoy herself. For the restaurant's relaunch, Chef Ramsay simplified the menu to focus on making Spin a Yarn a proper steakhouse. They sampled the new dishes and loved everything. On relaunch night, the San Jose Sharks came in to dine, and the restaurant was packed. The prime rib was a huge hit, and despite a scare that they might run out, Victor had ordered extra meat. Jennifer served the sharks, who ended up loving the food, and they even gifted Saki a jersey and took a picture with him. Insane. This menu is in accordance to what you've got to work with. By the end of the night, the whole family felt more connected, and Chef Ramsay praised their teamwork. <laughs> that was hard. You did a great job. Business started to pick up, and the prime rib became the star of the menu. Although some regulars didn't love all the changes, Saki and Jennifer brought back a few customer favorites to keep everyone happy. Spin a yarn. Steakhouse stayed open, and in May 2012, they hired a new head chef. Reviews after filming were mixed, but mostly positive, especially around 2019. The episode had originally aired on February 10, 2012, and was filmed in October 2011 during Season 5, Episode 11 of Kitchen Nightmares. Hold on to your aprons, because this transformation is a game changer. I guess I didn't think of it as that horrible or bad. That's disgusting. When was the last time this place was clean? In this episode of Kitchen Nightmares, Chef Ramsay Ramsay visited Lido de Manhattan in Manhattan Beach, California. The restaurant was owned by Lisa Hemet, a 28-year-old USC Business School graduate. Lisa had bought the restaurant at just 23 years old, despite having no experience in running a restaurant. She had inherited both the staff and customer base from the previous owners. I think that my parents gave it to me or I married somebody that gave it to me. It was just frustrating, but at the same time, I know the truth. So after I graduated college, I was bound and determined to only work for myself. But instead of starting from scratch, I started looking at existing businesses. Damien, who started as a server, had been promoted to bar manager and was also romantically involved with Lisa. The staff believed Lisa didn't really know what she was doing and that it was only their experience keeping the restaurant from failing. Lisa's a very smart person, but she doesn't have a, a lot of experience with restaurants. A lot of times uh, she gets things mixed up, uh, like she considers me as a friend, not as an employee. Initially, the restaurant had a buzz around it, but as time passed, it became mostly empty each night, putting its future in jeopardy. When Chef Ramsay arrived, he noticed the parking lot was full of potential customers. Meeting Lisa, he was shocked by how young she was, assuming at first that she had been given the restaurant. Instead, she explained that she had gotten a loan co-signed by her father, making her the boss. Lisa also admitted that she hadn't made any changes since purchasing the restaurant five years prior. 
Not the menu, not even the decor. As a vegetarian, she didn't eat most of the food on the menu. So this is the same menu that was off the previous owners a la carte. Mm -hmm. Luis and Arturo Martinez were the chef and sous chef, respectively, and had been working there for 18 years. Chef Ramsay sat down and ordered the baked eggplant roll, ahi tuna tower, and chicken tortellini salad. Damien introduced himself to Chef Ramsay at the table, revealing he was dating Lisa. Lovely boss. Sometimes when they refer to the boss as being lovely, it sounds like it's an intimate lovely. When the eggplant roll arrived, Chef Ramsay spat out the first bite. It was microwaved, crunchy, and raw. Next came the tuna tower, which Chef Ramsay found gross, realizing it was frozen tuna, despite Priscilla's claim that it was fresh. Finally, the tortellini pasta salad arrived, and Chef Ramsay learned it wasn't homemade. He described it as rubbery and asked Lisa to try the vegetarian portion. She thought it tasted fine. Mm. It tastes like rubber. That is hideous. Mm. Yeah, not very pleasant. Chef Ramsay then confronted the staff in the kitchen, telling them the food was horrible. The chefs claimed they had no power to make key decisions or changes. That evening, during dinner service, the servers struggled due to outdated technology. Their 30-year-old computers weren't functioning properly, causing missed orders. Even when customers got their food, many sent it back with complaints. We talked, but we don't have the power here to make decisions. We don't got the last war. Jesus Christ. The computers have been an issue for me from day one. Uh, it's really outdated. The keyboard's not even working properly, so. Inspecting the walk-in and freezer, Chef Ramsay discovered the tuna being served had been made four days prior. He also found frozen food Lisa wasn't even aware of and saw mounds of dust above the food preparation areas. Chef Ramsay showed Lisa the dirt and insisted the kitchen be shut down immediately. But she refused, believing the dust wouldn't have contaminated the food. Frustrated, Chef Ramsay brought customers into the kitchen to witness the dirt themselves, and none of them wanted to continue eating there. Lisa was humiliated and ended up crying in the bathroom for an hour. When was the last time this place was clean? Because of the shit and the dust. The next day, Chef Ramsay held a staff meeting where Lisa presented five changes she planned to implement. Chef Ramsay was impressed, but warned that execution would be challenging. He then had the staff smash the old POS system with a baseball bat for fun and trained Lisa and the chefs on a new fresh tuna dish. Before dinner service, Lisa took charge of the specials but became flustered by the pressure. Although customers enjoyed the specials, they continued to complain about regular menu items. Instead of fixing the issues, Arturo and Luis shifted blame. Lisa eventually stepped up, stopping the bickering and showing more confidence. Chef Ramsay praised her improvement, but cautioned that her lazy chefs could hinder her progress. I have a worse scenario than having lazy chefs. It is the quickest way of closing down. Overnight, Chef Ramsay's team revamped the restaurant, removing the dividing wall, adding seating, lighting, and rebranding it as a wine bar. A new POS system was also installed. During the relaunch, Lisa led the front of the house, but the kitchen struggled to keep up, causing long wait times. That horrendous wall that was dividing your restaurant has gone. Now, the whole thing just fills open. As orders pile up, customers become frustrated and Arturo and Luis walk out. Hello! We're giving up. Bye. Arturo! We're giving up, sir. Yeah, Bye. I know you're giving okay. up. Why? Chef Ramsay called in his friend Scott for help, and eventually, Arturo and Luis returned. With Scott's support, the kitchen caught up and the night ended on a high note. Afterwards, Chef Ramsay acknowledged Lisa's growth and commitment, but noted her kitchen staff's lack of dedication. Despite the setbacks, the relaunch was deemed a success, and Lisa felt more confident about making future changes. Really embrace these changes and make this place successful. Following Chef Ramsay's visit, the restaurant shifted focus to the wine bar. Chef Scott worked on training the chefs, and when Chef Ramsay revisited a year later, business had increased by 20%. Lisa had fired Damien, her boyfriend and bar manager. New dishes inspired by Chef Ramsay, including a mushroom flatbread, were added to the menu. Lisa also expanded into Lido brand wine, catering, and private dining. The restaurant continued hosting events like wine tastings and remained successful. In 2017, Lisa and her partner, Levi Lupercio, opened a new restaurant called Playa Hermosa Fish and Oyster, which received excellent reviews. Lido di Manhattan remained open and continued to thrive. 
And speaking of impressive turnarounds, wait until you see what happened here. I don't believe there's a better operator or restaurateur than me. Re take it! The rather, I'm not gonna to make you believe me. If you don't believe me, you don't believe me. In this Kitchen Nightmares episode, Chef Ramsey Ramsey visited the Old Stone Mill in Tuckahoe, New York. The restaurant had been bought by Dean Marazzo six years earlier, and he had converted the old mill into a restaurant. All the renovation, except for the electrical work, had been done by Dean himself. The restaurant had been open for four years, but despite Dean's confidence in his abilities as a restaurateur, they had no customers. What happens if I open up, staffed up, food ready, and no one decides to come here? Dean spent his time looking out the windows for customers, while Chef Michael had lost his passion. Most of their customers were the elderly residents from an assisted living facility behind the restaurant. Dean couldn't figure out why they weren't attracting more people, even though he was struggling to pay the staff and keep up with his mortgage. He mentioned how hard it had been to provide for his family. When you're making no money, it's very hard to convince you that tomorrow is going to be a better day when you have bills to pay. When Chef Ramsey arrived, he didn't understand why the restaurant wasn't busier, as the building looked beautiful from the outside. Inside, he was greeted by Dean, Tom, and Jeannie, the hostess, and commented on how lovely the decor was. Chef Ramsay guessed that the issue must be the food, but Dean assured him the food was good. Chef Ramsay sat down to order, starting with crab cakes, shrimp, chopped salad, risotto, and tilapia stuffed with lobster. 30 minutes later, the crab cakes arrived, and Chef Ramsay found them strange, with an off taste like sour mayonnaise. It tastes really strange. I can't put my finger on it. Something really weird in there, it's like a... He didn't care for the shrimp either, questioning why anyone would fry it. I've eaten some prawns in my life, but me, that's the first. Not to count. Make it out, Gordon. The chopped salad was served in an odd shape, as it had been squashed into a funnel. Dean insisted people enjoyed the dish, but Chef Ramsay hated it. The tilapia, served in a brown paper bag, was also a letdown. And the mushroom risotto was so bad that it stuck to the roof of Chef Ramsay's mouth. He was in my house and he was embarrassing me. Your food's crap. After tasting the food, Chef Ramsay met with Dean and learned that the crab meat wasn't fresh. Chef Ramsay asked Dean to try the dishes and told him they were all terrible. The next day, Chef Ramsay sat down with Dean and his wife, Barbara, to talk about the restaurant's finances. Barbara admitted that Dean kept her in the dark to protect her from the stress he had been feeling. Chef Ramsay warned Barbara that if things didn't improve, she would have reason to worry, especially with their house on the line. Barbara was shocked to discover how much debt they were in. No reason for her to share these anxiety and nerves that I have. Totally unnecessary. Please don't get upset. I know. That night, Chef Ramsay observed the Saturday dinner service. The restaurant was busy, but Chef Michael struggled, as he was the only one working in the kitchen. Dishes took over an hour to come out, and when they did, customers were unhappy, sending food back to the kitchen. Under pressure from Dean to prioritize speed, Michael's cooking suffered, and more dishes were returned. After the chaotic service, Chef Ramsay met with the staff, calling out Dean for rushing orders and not taking pride in the food. No, I'm not saying it is easy. Michael works more than is expected of a normal chef. He does above and beyond. The entrees will come soon. They should be. That's true. The next day, Chef Ramsay explored the local competition and noticed there were no steakhouses in the area. Then, he met with Michael in the kitchen and showed him a new way to make the chopped salad. The following day, Chef Ramsay presented his plan to Dean, Tom, and Michael. He suggested they transform the Old Stone Mill into a steakhouse, but Dean was skeptical, seeing a dramatic change in concept as a sign of weakness. You're not telling me anything. You, this is your own figment of your imagination that I don't have a commitment to this place. On relaunch day, Chef Ramsay's team worked overnight to redesign the restaurant, including adding a new sign outside so people would know it was a restaurant. The dining room looked stunning, and Chef Ramsay introduced a new steakhouse menu. He showed Tom how to sell the menu by presenting a board of fresh steaks to customers. On relaunch night, the restaurant was fully booked, and customers loved the new look. However, Tom struggled under the pressure, and 45 minutes into service, only a few customers had been served. The natural stone, the old stone mill steakhouse. Michael had trouble with the printer, and Dean's shouting only made matters worse. Chef Ramsay stepped in, gathered the team, and got things back on track. Once the printer was fixed, the food went out quickly, and customers, including the mayor, were pleased with their meals. The relaunch was a success. The next day, Chef Ramsay met with Dean and pointed out that his fear of failure was holding him back. 
Chef Ramsay shared stories of his own failed restaurants, encouraging Dean to stop avoiding problems. Ab and Dean admitted he needed to change and couldn't continue to overlook things. I failed before in business, and it made me the person I am today, having both success and failure. In the weeks that followed, everyone stepped up. Michael's passion returned, and his food greatly improved. Dean took control of both the front and back of the house, while Tom grew more confident as a manager. A prime rib looks to die for right there. This is the steak for real steak eaters. The restaurant hosted a barbecue to celebrate the building's 200th anniversary, and the mayor gave Dean the key to the city. And then a light-up sign was also added to the side of the restaurant to increase visibility. For you, we'd like you to hang this also, the key wow. to the city of Yonkers. Wow. <laughs> getting the key to the city. I'm excited for my husband because I see the smile back in his face. After the show aired, Dean made appearances on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno and The Ellen DeGeneres Show. When Chef Ramsay revisited the restaurant a year later, it seemed to be doing well, with business up by 30%. However, the Old Stone Mill was eventually sold to the DiNapoli family in 2009, though Chef Michael stayed on in the kitchen. For a while after the sale, Dean was still listed as the owner and Louis DiNapoli served as general manager. Reviews on Yelp were mixed, though more positive on TripAdvisor. Over time, reviews became less favorable, and the Facebook page was eventually renamed DiNapoli's Stone Mill Restaurant. In November 2018, under new management, the restaurant shifted away from the steakhouse concept and focused more on Italian and classic American dishes. The DiNapoli family sold the restaurant in 2022, and it reopened as Wicked Wolf North in September of that year. Dean also pursued some acting roles in minor movies and co-owned Siena Italian Trattoria with his friend John Hirschbeck. They opened the restaurant in Stratford in 2011, serving Italian food, following Chef Ramsay's suggestion that Dean should return to his Italian roots. The restaurant received mostly positive Yelp reviews, but closed in 2015. Dean also co-hosted a hunting show called Suburban Adventures, which was about hunting and cooking your kills. The Old Stone Mill episode aired on October 17, 2007 and was filmed in March 2007 as part of Kitchen Nightmares Season 1, Episode 5. Now, let's take a closer look at how this restaurant achieved its success. Mike is a very proud person. He does not take criticism well. But Jeff Ramsey's here to help. He's not here to compliment. I just to smell that. Just smell inside that. It smells. Yes. It's good. It's sick. In this episode of Kitchen Nightmares, Chef Ramsey Ramsey visited the Greek at the harbor in Ventura, California, which was owned by Makis and Lynn Mikolaitos. The couple had run the restaurant since 1994, and it had done well in the 90s. Oh my gosh, it's really good. We did great. It was always busy. Whoop! Uh, already, guys. However, after 17 years, Makis felt worn out, and business suffered along with the drop in customers. He's been working 365 days a year for 17 years. He's just burning out from being here so long. It was rubbery. Their son, Aris, wanted to get more involved and help turn things around. But Macus wasn't ready to listen to his ideas. He believed Aris was good with people, but didn't have the skills in the kitchen. Went on. My dad's standards have dropped. OK, I got a complaint. Hey, guys, they said the cafetas were rock hard. Yeah. Huh? When Chef Ramsay arrived, he was impressed with the restaurant's location. He sat down with Lynn, Macus, and Eris to talk about their situation and learned they hadn't made a profit in years. <clears throat> the more effort and money they put into the restaurant, the worse it seemed to get. They were on the brink of closing due to the lack of income. Chef Ramsay was shocked to find out Macus had worked non-stop for 17 years without a single vacation. Even though Eris was eager to take over, Macus didn't plan to pass the restaurant on to him. Well, I'm here and I'm doing all the, a lot of stuff right now. I mean, sure. Do you work in the kitchen? I don't, but that's one of my goals. I want to learn the kitchen. Makis claimed the food was a 10, saying they had authentic Greek recipes. But when Chef Ramsay ordered calamari, sampler platters, and moussaka, he got a different story. Dimitri, who served him, wasn't very enthusiastic about the food either. Chef Ramsay found the calamari greasy, the hummus watery, and the meatballs cold. The moussaka was so bad he called all the chefs over to address the situation, telling them the food was an embarrassment to Greek cuisine. The kitchen staff complained they weren't allowed to cook the way they had been trained. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. Oh, dear. So, Greek dips. It looks like sick plates of Greek That's what it goes in like. Imagine what's going to come out like. Later, during dinner service, Chef Ramsay did a kitchen inspection and discovered all the food was pre-cooked and just reheated. Marika, the owner's daughter, worked at the POS. The food went out quickly, but customers sent it back just as fast due to issues like raw or cold dishes. It was a mess. 
Chef Ramsay talked to Eris, who said his dad was tired of running the place but didn't want to let go. It was a disaster. I mean, I've just sat down and had the biggest embarrassment to Greece. What hurts me is the fact that you're actually realizing that it's and still sending it. In a surprising twist, Eris put on a Greek dance performance during dinner, which left Chef Ramsay in disbelief. They checked the food that had been sent back, and Chef Ramsay didn't hold back on how terrible it was. Makis got emotional and left the scene. Chef Ramsay later found out from Lynn that Eris had disrespected his parents at his graduation party, which had strained their relationship. They all sat down to clear the air, and Aris apologized, promising to be more involved. You don't like it? The veggies came out raw, and then I brought out more, and they were still raw. The students are uh, deeply hurt from what... Still skeptical about Eris's commitment, Chef Ramsay handcuffed father and son together, challenging Makis to teach Eris. They managed to make a decent Greek pasta dish together, impressing Chef Ramsay. And then, Makis agreed to pass on his knowledge about running the restaurant. The design team got to work on a makeover, and the next morning, they revealed a bright new look for the restaurant with Greek-themed decor. Everyone was pleasantly surprised, and Makis hugged Chef Ramsay in appreciation. A new menu was introduced with a modern twist on classic Greek dishes. With hideous chairs that were set up with no charm. So, We've taken a turkey. On relaunch night, Makis oversaw the salad station while Aris acted as the expediter. Aris hit the ground running, keeping the food moving and the customers happy. Chef Ramsay offered some feedback, and when an uncooked fish dish almost went out, Aris told the team to slow down and focus on quality. He caught mistakes and corrected them, which left Makis amazed at how well his son handled things. Most importantly, the customers loved the food, making the relaunch a huge success. How do you guys like the new menu? Eris took charge of the kitchen and was determined to maintain the high standards. The restaurant became popular and Makis even considered retirement. The Greeks stayed open, keeping their Facebook page updated with specials, events, and new menu items. Most Yelp reviews were positive, though some regulars weren't fans of all the menu changes. TripAdvisor reviews were mostly good, with just a few negative ones sprinkled in. The Greek at the Harbor episode aired on November 18th, 2011, and was filmed in August 2011 as part of Season 5, Episode 7 of Kitchen Nightmares. Get ready, because this next story is all about beating the odds. Just had one of the most disgusting lunches I've ever had. There's a man vomiting in the toilet now. In this episode of Kitchen Nightmares, Chef Ramsay Ramsay visited Mama Maria's in Brooklyn, New York. Mama Maria's was a sister restaurant to Sal's Pizzeria, and the two were connected. Sal and Maria owned Sal's since the 1970s, and it ran smoothly until their son, John Esposito, took over in 1990. John joined the family business at 14, and by the time he took charge, they had expanded by buying the restaurant next door. After Maria passed away, they renamed the second space Mama Maria's in her honor. Over the years, sales at both restaurants dropped off. John struggled to manage both places and felt overwhelmed. He was also stubborn and let his kids run wild in the restaurant. Plus, he didn't keep up with the changing neighborhood and its needs. We don't have that kind of volume of sales that we once had. Then I can't figure out the reason why it dropped off. Where's the people? Lack of leadership. Uh, John's a little frantic, chaotic, um, usually very busy in the pizzeria. John has been here forever. When Chef Ramsay arrived, he was put off by the shabby exterior, especially the ripped awning that covered the restaurant's name. He walked inside and met Fabio, the general manager, who told him that John was next door at Sal's, making all the pizzas. Chef Ramsay headed over and found John, who explained that they were struggling due to increased competition. What is that? That is ghastly. Holes everywhere. That is not a good sign. Chef Ramsay decided to order lunch at Mama Maria's. He scanned the menu, which claimed all the pasta was made fresh daily. He ordered tortellini di patate, spaghetti and meatballs, and a margarita pizza. When dessert arrived, one of the cakes looked moldy, but Fabio insisted it was just for display. Chef Ramsay thought it was ridiculous to show off old desserts and was offended by Fabio's attitude. I'm aware you're not serving it, thank fuck gold star. Congratulations on that one, that's, uh, that's a big breakthrough with you. That's why you're here. Give me two seconds, I need to clean my hands. I'm caked in mold, I've got disgusting butter, and I've got fucking hands full of pus. When the tortellini arrived, Chef Ramsay found it bland and was shocked to learn they made it fresh, but then froze it for later use. He noticed an overwatered plant in the dining area, and when he moved it, water spilled everywhere, soaking innocent diners. 
He promised to pay for their dry cleaning. Bland. I ain't really bland. I'll let them know. And this is frozen because there's a grainy potato flavor inside that. What's that smell in here? Ah, shit. Next up were the meatballs, which Chef Ramsay could tell were frozen just by looking at them. They were rubbery and dry, and the pizza was too greasy. Chef Ramsay suspected John wasn't tasting the food before it went out. Upset by the feedback, John threw pizza boxes around in anger. Look at that, how dry that is. The dry, disgusting, frozen meatballs. Chef Ramsay met the kitchen staff, Joe, Oscar, and Valentino, and explained his concerns. John defended the use of frozen food, claiming it was the standard practice. Chef Ramsay argued that times had changed and higher standards were now expected. John said making fresh meatballs took too long, but even the chef admitted the food quality was poor and he had no control over the menu. Later that evening, Chef Ramsay observed dinner service and saw John focused only on making pizza, ignoring everything else happening in the kitchen. Customers complained about a vegetarian dish that had a meat bone in the sauce, and one diner became sick after eating a lobster tail that smelled awful. John had to call an ambulance, which made other diners uncomfortable, leading to the restaurant being shut down for the night with no charges made. Are you okay? Because I can't hear you. Are you waiting for the uh, bumping bunny? Chef Ramsay took John aside to discuss the disastrous service and pointed out that the problem stemmed from John's poor practices. John seemed defeated, worried about providing for his family, and got emotional about the restaurant's struggles. Chef Ramsay urged him to change for the sake of his kids. The next day, Chef Ramsay inspected the freezers and found tons of frozen food, some covered in mold and freezer burn. Nothing was labeled or dated, making it impossible to tell what was what. Chef Ramsay brought it all out to show the sheer amount of frozen food, revealing it was a year's worth. He updated John that the sick customer was recovering and had been discharged from the hospital. John acknowledged it was his fault for buying the same amount of product as when they were more successful. Chef Ramsay urged him to let go of the past, especially since the specials hadn't changed since his parents passed. John admitted the restaurant was his life, but he didn't want it to keep failing. Chef Ramsay reminded him he needed to take charge. For a margarita pizza, it's very greasy. The following day, Chef Ramsay unveiled the first change, a bold new sign replacing the old awning. Inside, the restaurant looked modern and vibrant, featuring art of the Brooklyn Bridge and photos of his parents around New York. The menu got a refresh with smaller dishes made from fresh ingredients. Oh, that awning's gone. That's the right. Totally the awning gone. has gone. Let me welcome you to the new sign. It was dark, it was grimy, and it had no life. We got stunning turquoise walls. On relaunch night, Chef Ramsay invited food critics, journalists, and bloggers. John was nervous about impressing them. The kitchen started off well, but John wasn't managing his staff and was found at the bar instead. After a pep talk from Chef Ramsay, he stepped up, mingled with customers, and took control. The night ended successfully, with diners loving both the atmosphere and the food. A few months later, business was reportedly up 10%. Some old customer favorites returned to the menu at their request, but John kept most of Chef Ramsay's updated dishes with just a few tweaks. Unfortunately, Mama Maria's and Sal's Pizzeria closed in February 2023 because John decided to retire. After Chef Ramsay's visit, Yelp reviews were mostly positive, although recent reviews in 2019 mentioned that the seafood might be frozen. TripAdvisor reviews were also generally good, with negative comments regarding missed takeout orders. The episode aired on November 9th, 2012, and was filmed in June 2012 as part of Season 6, Episode 3 of Kitchen Nightmares. And that wraps up our look at the most successful Kitchen Nightmares restaurants. It's amazing how these spots transformed their fortunes with Chef Ramsay's help. Which restaurant surprised you the most? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to drop a like and subscribe for more awesome content. And by the way, if you thought watching these restaurants turn a new leaf was wholesome, then you better watch this next video on MasterChef contestants and where they're at today. Trust me, some of these revelations are shocking. Which I just have to say that if you had a restaurant, I would become your regular customer because I like your style.